Hello and welcome back to the last hour for Friday on ICMI 2021. And we just got done watching AJ Mahari, who is a counselor to help primarily men, she helps some women, but primarily men deal with toxic environments. How are you doing today, AJ? Oh, I'm doing fine. How are you? I am wonderful. So we have the opportunity to ask her some stuff and maybe share a couple of personal stories. So feel free to load in the Q&A and we'll be looking at those and asking her your questions. And so I'm, we'll go ahead. What's up? Uh, uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to actually... Actually, now we have a question from Blair Daly. I was actually going to read a comment he said in the uh, last stream, but let's go ahead and read this. What are the best things men can do who've gotten out of a long-term relationship with women with personality disorders, and now they're determined to make a wiser choice of a female partner the next time around? They're determined to have low-conflict, mostly peaceful relationships with a woman. Well, I think the number one thing there, and it might sound for some people like it's overboard, but it's really important to get into therapy. Really important to look into um, one's history and family of origin because often people aren't aware of how they got hurt in their childhood. And the issue often for people who've been with someone in a relationship or man being, who's been with a woman with a personality disorder, often what comes along with that is codependency. So there's usually some childhood woundedness at some point, and it varies great, greatly because some people's parents did a great job. And, but there's something there that is what I've seen in the work I've been doing for 31 years. There's, there's always a connector back to family of origin and some woundedness there that is carried forward in the unconscious. So I think therapy is a really important answer, uh, like process to go through and also to take a pause and to know to, for, for people to become, for men to know themselves better and to understand more how they got there. And that's a way to moving forward to never get in that type of situation relationship again. I think another important aspect of that is sometimes when it comes to relationships, like any woman that shows any interest in us, we're just so quick to jump into that relationship. And it might seem great at first, but then once the honeymoon phase is over or new relationship energy is over, then we really meet the person we're in a relationship with. And one counter to that is to try to spend time getting to know them first before you start dating them. Now, that might reduce your chances of being able to date them, but... <laughs> Sorry. Well, there's there's also might... that... There's also with personality disorder women, this incredible intensity and this incredible mirroring that happens so that when a man meets a woman with, you know, be it borderline personality, narcissistic personality disorder, and they will have no idea about that going into it. Um, the feeling, it, it's sort of like that feeling, you know, how boundaries go down when people are falling in love in a slower, healthier way. This is like, feels like, I don't know, I've heard it put like a million times better. Everything is just happens more quickly, so it's really hard to slow it down. And then often, not always, but the intimacy, the sex is incredible. And I'm not saying that's the only thing that hooks men by a long shot. But the thing is, so it, it's really hard for people to be able to do, but, because what I wanted to say is they mirror so much the other person when in fact they're not who the person who's falling in love with them thinks they are at all, but they don't know that. So that's what the honeymoon phase and these types of when, when a man is with a personality disorder a woman, it's um, there's no way to slow it down. And it happens so fast and it feels so good. And then it becomes a trauma bond because when things start to, when they come to the first evaluation or, or, you know, being really difficult or seeming really weird and different, then the man's only going to fight hard. So will women with men, but only going to fight harder 
to get back to what it was like. And there's where it all starts to really go downhill because you can't get back to what it was like. I will also say that one of the best ways in interacting with women that you're interested in romantically is expose them to your friends, um, guy friends, girl type friends, um, because when we're wanting to court someone, we can be blinded to their personalities or overlook things so easily. But having an outside perspective, take a look at who, how they act and how they act when we're not there can be a good way to get a second opinion of, is this woman worth it or is she secretly toxic and I just don't see it? But you don't 100% go with what your friends say, but take that into consideration. And I totally think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And then, but then with the personality disordered woman, um, friends will tell the person, hey, you know, there's this problem, there's that problem, there's this red flag, they seem controlling, they seem, but the good feels so good. And this is where the codependency comes into comes in is is and people often can't listen to the people around them all right next question from douglas wallace i have problems with the concept of personality disorders people will often say things like i don't want to become someone different is there a better way to ex express or to explain the concept of changing personality well, it's interesting because I, I don't like the concept of personality disorders either, but it's the sort of the linguistics of it all that we're stuck with. But I think that with people where we use the personality disorder construct or traits and diagnostic labels, these are people that more often than not, like high percentage, have had trauma in their childhood that starts at such a young age that it's primal that then they have arrested emotional development. So this is in BPD and NPD, for example, and it's something that's denoted. It was always meant to denote something more for clinicians to understand to help people than for everybody else out there to kind of be trying to figure out, is, is this person this or that? But um, I think personality changes. Um, people can have lots of things that change about themselves. Things in the relationship can change. And when they're talked about and there's compromises and there's mutuality and and reciprocity, lots can be very positive, even though relationships take work. But what we're talking about with the personality disorder construct, which I wish there was a better way to put it, is we're talking about people that don't know themselves. And so they're very much arrested in the de their development, and their changes are like night and day mass massive. And they don't see the other person, and they don't hear the other person. And then they also don't understand the difference between self and other. So they, they're they not just changing. They're just always trying to, they're actually trying to live through other people. So it's different than if someone has, you know, people do change. People have, you know, a change of mood or a change of heart over things. But this is like way, way more intense and and, and it takes treatment to change. So another question from Douglas Wallace. I have often been a rescuer in relationships, something I don't I didn't realize until way too late, of course. How can a man recognize the difference between the normal masculine desires to care and protect and the danger of being a rescuer? Well, that's a really good question, because again, um, when one is a rescuer, it's likely got some codependency there too. So again, sometimes therapy is a good idea. It doesn't have to be a long-term situation, but I think that um, that's probably really, really difficult for men to tell the difference between, especially if they're dealing with a woman who is really not mentally well. And, and otherwise, I mean, the other thing too is that the message that a lot of men are getting from a lot of women let's just say with mental health issues, whether it's personality disorder, construct, or whatever, the message is, yes, I, I love you, and I want you to protect me, but get away from me, and I don't need you, because, like, who said that you could control me? It gets into all these complicated dynamics where, 
where the, where the person doesn't have enough emotional EQ. So I think that makes it really hard for, for men. And that's, again, why I'm going to stress that rescuer beyond sort of the whole stereotypical idea and what men may believe is, is their role to be the protector and partially maybe well be, that's where there's codependency. That's where there's still something, some wooniness from childhood that needs to be examined. Because there's there's no other way to just know how to change that without really understanding where that's coming from. Because it's not just coming from being a man. It's also coming from some wilderness in childhood. Well, in parallel to this um, rescuer, I was once a gift giver. But I kind of did it for the wrong reason. And it took a lot of self-reflection. And I think there's a parallel with the rescuer here because oftentimes when we want to be the rescuer, we're kind of hoping for a reward. Mm-hmm. You know, we I, I want to be rescue the damsel in distress, and she gives me a kiss afterwards. And it was everything I went through just for that little affection is worth it. And one of the things I had to do to break myself out of being such a gift giving person, because I love giving things to other people, mm-hmm. but I had to ask myself, why am I giving something to someone? Am I doing it because I genuinely want to give it or am I doing it because I'm hoping something develops from it? Like I give this gift and hope they'll feel an obligation to give me something because what would happen to me is if I did it for that reason, and then they didn't do it, I'd grow angry at them. Like, how dare they not give me something in return when I gave it to them, which then would send me into a vicious cycle because you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to give with the expectation to receive. So then I would start hating myself for feeling that way. So in the case of being a rescuer, I mean, they're, you're perfectly fine caring about someone, but honestly ask yourself, Am I doing this in hopes that they will be indebted to me of gratitude that they would want to repay me? Or am I doing this because I truly want to be there for them? Yeah, I think that what you're describing, not to keep putting labels on things, is that when people are unsure of that or maybe not aware that they are in a way giving to get or trying to fix a rescue to make things work, that it's an abandonment of self and that it isn't going to work. And that that's, um, and, and it means that there's broken mutuality and, and there isn't reciprocity when somebody keeps giving and somebody else doesn't give you anything back. Well, uh, some of the questions have been really good so far. I, I would like to get some more going on, so keep them rolling. Um, so I want to shift gears just a little bit. So. Uh, before this talk, you were talking about uh, the things you were learning from this conference itself. So can, can you share some highlights, some uh, interesting things that came out of ICMI 21? Well, I mean, I still have a lot to watch, but um, I would just say I was totally blown away at the depth and the scope of this conference and all of the different um, topics and, and information. Um, it, it just... It blew me away in a way that was like, I still have a lot to learn, you know, for sure. And the other thing is that that all, it, it sort of gave me a really deeper idea even than I already had of exactly a wider area of like what's really happening with men. And so culturally and with media and with stereotypes and you know, and, and, and of course, the gynocentrism in society. So I must say that just all of the topics, some some I thought, you know, yeah, definitely would be there, but there's way more than I ever thought there would be, which is like good news that they're all being addressed here and people can be educated, but sad on the other hand that all that's really necessary, but we know that it is. Well, I often laugh to myself when I see comments online or in person when they hear that there's a men's day, international men's day, or there's a men's conference. And it's like, well, why do men need a day? Isn't every day men's day? Or why do they need a conference? You know, and it's like, 
you and I'm not saying that you do this at all, but it's like you get to see, and I wish they got to see it too. Like this is everything that we have to talk about. It's not just a couple of issues that we're sort of focusing on and that we're misconstruing or we're trying to be victims. There's a lot going on and we're very prepared to talk about it all. Yeah. And, and it really all needs to be talked about and men really need to learn more from wherever different men are at, but so too to women because this dichotomy of, you know, the radical to the feminists and the gynocentrism versus men is just, it's, it's got to change. It's got to keep shifting. Women have to wait. Can I just say the hell up? And I feel passionate about that. And I also know, like, I'm not in, in okay, it doesn't matter. I'm not in contact with family of origin. But so I have a relative that I couldn't have a relationship with anyway because they got their Ph.D. in women's studies, feminism, and uh, I don't know, gender something politics or whatever it was called. And so they're so fervent and they're so immovable. Right. And then so many women get influenced by that as well as the gynocentrism that I think we grow up with until we open our eyes and realize that, you know, because even when I was a kid growing up, I heard. And of course, I'm older now, but still, I think young girls may hear that this big oppression narrative and this idea that, like, you know, men are in control of everything. And, you know, and so it's it's yeah, it's huge. And and I know that. Some of the comments I did read from some talks and some people were talking about the long haul and the, the effect of people that jump in to help in this, you know, men's area and education and, and for women to learn more and how they burn out quickly and, and what is the long game and what does it look like. And, and it kind of breaks my heart in a way to say that, you know, I think while well, a lot of progress is being made, it's like, but how far up the hill is it yet? Because, you know, for every man, I wish it was way further up the hill than it is. Well, my favorite saying is every woman is a feminist until the dinner check comes. Well, that's a good saying. I want to read a couple of things from the chat. And this was in relation to uh, Douglas Wallace's last uh, question about uh, being a rescuer. And Carl, Carl Palmer says a rescuer sees the other person as a victim. Douglas um, stated, I think for me personally, I was a rescuer, so I would be seen as a good person in general. To be seen as a good person by me as much as anything. Mm -hmm. Carl states, a rescuer can shift focus to be a coach. Instead of seeing the other person as a victim, see them as a creator capable of working through their own issues. Well, what's really key with that is that no adult should be doing for another adult what that adult should be doing for themselves. And that kind of goes right across the board. And, and maybe it's more challenging for men because there is this, I think there still are women out there, but they'll give mixed messages more than not that think the man is supposed to be the protector. And I'm not saying that a man couldn't have some of that going on, but, I, but, but I'm not sure if that's where sometimes what's happened to men in, in their socialization growing up hasn't helped them in the sense that, you know, I think like it speaks to men's personhood and men being people first rather than being any specific thing for a woman. Absolutely. So uh, Douglas Wallace has another question. How can a partner be safely encouraged to talk to someone about a mental health issue that they aren't even aware of? And how can someone be sure the problem is not their own? Yeah, those are good questions. I think the first thing is that it's not really ever advised that people talk to a partner about suspected mental health issues or whatever, because usually it, you know, like 98% of the time, or maybe like 95% of the time doesn't go well. And that in of itself could be a little bit in the rescuer role, as, as much as it's very difficult to not. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of that? Yeah, sure. And how can you be, uh, sorry, um, how can someone be sure the problem is not their own? 
Well, I mean, I think that goes again to how well people know themselves, but when people are with people with mental illness or personality disorders, uh, often people will feel like it is them and they will take it on because people, women specifically with personality disorders we're talking about here, they will definitely be blaming. They will be externalizing out all their feelings. They will project out what they've just done to someone. And then the other person is, is there going like, what happened here? Because like everything was fine. And so it's, it's really difficult to, um, a lot of people will feel that it is them when it isn't them. And that's another reason to check in and get a little help in processing if people have been through these types of relationships. And that also is something that is pretty much the experience of people who get into um, code, like that are relating from a codependent place, maybe unknowingly, because when you seek to rescue another, often there's something that people don't know that they don't feel so good about themselves. And so they need to learn more about what that is. Or my solution, blackjack and hookers. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, let me ask you about that. Um, it seems like relationships these days are more minefield than anything else, that almost every relationship is going to end badly, that women are too busy looking for the top of the line guy. And if they do date someone, it's just more of a temporary stepping stone to what they actually want. Um, would it be healthier for men then to just kind of say, you know what, there's no good women out there, but I still want sex. I might as well just pay someone for that rather than trying to develop an honest relationship. Well, I mean, um, that's really difficult to say because, you know, one would hope that um, people could, like sometimes people do have to pause, get in therapy, process some things. It, you can come out stronger knowing yourself much more better, uh, more better, sorry, much more um, like thoroughly, right, and emotionally, and then maybe be able to make different choices. So, but, but that's a hard question. Like, I don't have the ultimate answer because I think for some men, they just can't see a way forward to try to relate to, to, to the women that they're meeting or, the, you know, in their age group or et cetera. And, and for some men, they will. They will go that way, right? They, they just won't. They just can't foresee themselves having ever a relationship work out with a female, which is not to say it's their issue. So uh, I think that I think it's going to be different for for many men, right? So I can't give an ultimate answer on that. I think if, if that's how some men feel, and then they definitely maybe that's what they do need to do, which is really sad. But I think the other thing I guess that's working against men and in a lot of areas is like I know on dating apps and, and I read some study on this recently where there are just so many more women and it depends on the age group, but there'll be many more women and then they kind of get to sit there and pick and whatever. And, and it's harder for men. So, yeah, but as to what the ultimate solution would be, I don't know. Cause that would be up to every individual man. And I guess I would say, you know, try to look at, um, if there's anything that you think you would like to explore, to know yourself better, to come from a different position in terms of trying to date women going forward, or some men just don't want to. And I think, too, if I can just say, and everything isn't about this, but it's certainly my area of specialty, there are more and more what they call cluster B access to uh, women out there, maybe some more men too, but right now we're talking about the women, uh, that, that keeps getting exponentially worse. So stats are way behind in what does that mean, but I think the latest, uh, the last one I saw recently, which isn't totally accurate by any means, was 6% of women in the United States alone probably have borderline personality disorder. So it's going to be an astounding number of women, and, and this is getting worse because of what causes it and because it's being more pathologized. So it, yeah. And, and that goes the same for NPD and high conflictual people. And then there's all the cultural aspects of what's happening between men and women that isn't helping men and women get together. 
So one thing I wanted to comment on, because before you said that you feel like you have like a, a lot to learn from uh, from going through uh, the subjects in this conference. But one thing I want to point out that was it's really impressive to me is your clear recognition of the problem of gynocentrism. Whereas for most people, uh, even supposedly those that claim to fight for men, you know, gynocentrism is not as much a word in the vernacular as it should be. It's not recognized as a problem. So I wanted to offer my praises to you for really recognizing this. Oh, well, well, thank you for that. But I must say that my eyes were opened by all the work I've done with men over the years, you know, just man after man, various ages, but many younger men and how much tougher things seem to be for younger men. That doesn't mean it's way easier for older men. And, uh, and yeah, like you kind of mentioned in the interview and, and a lot of men that have really woken me up and then, you know, and then I've done some reading and then I still have a lot more to learn, but recognizing, like, I think I might've said when we talked before, but it was really hard for me to come to just realize, and it wasn't out of a book. I just sat down one day and thought about this stuff uh, because of what I was hearing from clients that, you know, that wave of feminism in the 60s and the cultural revolution, and I'm a late stage baby boomer, but I was a kid when that was happening. But it was really hard for me. Maybe it's been only five or seven years ago. I sat down and realized that that, that really, you know, basically destroyed the family as a unit. And so what does that really mean? So as a woman, I say, and I really hold this view, that if a woman is going, wants to get married, and a man and woman want to get married, and they want to have children, then they got to stop screaming about equal rights or equal opportunity or equal equality of outcome because it's the way we're made. It's a biological determinist thing that I believe every woman should be with every child that they give birth to for seven years. That creates mentally healthy children. So, again, I think a lot of the issues of gynocentrism and, and then there's the sort of microcosm of it in each young boy's life, not saying every mother's a horrible mother or whatever, but so many mothers have taken this in and don't even understand and so, again, it goes back to family socialization of young boys. And there's still, that's where the ultimate, I guess the only word to use is failure, is, is still the deepest um, aspect of everything. Fun fact, gynocentrism is not a recognized word in Microsoft Word. Wow. Huh. So, yeah, well, I know whenever I've used the word, whenever I type it, wherever I type it, I, I spell it right, but it keeps telling me it couldn't possibly be a word. Same with me, too. Uh, it doesn't uh, register in Microsoft Word or Open Office either, because so I, I use Open Office. So. Well, I think I used it once on YouTube, and it, would, it, it still thought I was spelling it wrong, too. All right, so we have a question from Dean Hedges. Would the deterioration of women's health outlook be a good aspect factor to promote men's issues can you just repeat that for me please would the deteriorating women's health outlook be a good aspect or factor to promote men's issues yes i think it is and i think that probably the reason i'm here what i usually talk about and the clients i work with um definitely because it, it not only educated me a whole lot, although there's a lot more to learn, but yeah, definitely, because uh, there are more men all over the internet who've been in these relationships with personality disorder or not mentally well or lacking health emotionally, women uh, that are definitely, uh, that's how often many men find out about men's philosophies, men's conferences, and information for men. All right. Douglas Wallace has another question. It sounds like a partner can't really know whether a problem is their own or their partner's or even just a clash of personality. Does it make sense for anyone in a partnership to always start therapy with their partner so the professional can sort out what's going on? Is that too asking too much of a professional? Well, there are there are marriage and couples counselors out there. And the only thing is, if, if someone, so not necessarily in every case, 
But if someone believes that they're with somebody who's very erratic and may well have a personality disorder, then couples counseling is really not recommended. So it depends on the situation. And then I would recommend that a person who's not sure what's happening or if it's very painful and the relationship is very difficult, to say the very least, then it's best to seek their own counseling first. Because, because so many people will be with partners that aren't going to go to counseling. And then the other reality is, um, depending on the issues, right, so if they're in the personality disorder area, for lack of better language, uh, a lot of marriage and family counselors are not trained in that, are not aware of that. And then both people, it, it, things explode because there isn't enough skill. Uh, and there isn't really a way to help a couple when the issues of a personality disorder or, you know, really high conflict and arrested emotional development are in there, then, then it's not like the kind of relationship where if people could just communicate better. You know, couples counseling is more for what one might term sort of the healthier relationships and the sort of average issues and, and things that people deal with and how relationships do take work than it is with somebody who's who's not like one partner that's really mentally unhealthy. So I have a challenge for you um, because this is something I often wonder about people who are in therapy and I've known some not so great people who stated they were in therapy but didn't really seem like it was helping them. How do you deal with I mean, have you really dealt with anyone that you thought was really lying about what they were telling you? Because, I mean, you only really have to rely, you only rely really on what they have to say to you. And they could say, hey, everyone is treating me very meanly, but it might be because they're an asshole themselves. And it's like, how do you um, address that or... I, I don't really know how to ask this question, but it's just like I had a stepfather who went into therapy and his therapist said that the, all his problems was my mom. Well, no, he was a lazy ass fuck who just didn't want to do anything for anyone else. But of course, the therapist didn't really know that. So, mm -hmm. well, I think, you know, the way I work with clients is. First and foremost, they'll come and they might say, well, I don't know if my girlfriend or my ex or my ex-wife, whatever the case, has BP or not, but, but this is what's been happening. So um, patterns, and then the other thing that I work with clients on is like looking at their family of origin, their history, what's been happening for them as well. So it's not just one-sided in that way. And another thing is I've had clients where um, – like a lot of personality disorder people might get together at times, and that's not to say that's the case always for sure. But I've had clients come along, and they do uh, tend to be describing, um, say, a, an ex with BPD, for example, and they seem to be having the issues of codependency. And then I can just tell after a certain period of time, which is getting quicker and quicker all the time, actually, for years of experience, that you, you know, you, if you really are an expert in this area, like many people are, you can start to ferret out, you, you can start to see the narcissistic personalities or in some individuals, other things happening for the individual. That still doesn't mean that they're not in the right area as to what they've experienced from someone else. But that would be when the case is more that it isn't so much just one person versus the other one. Sometimes it is really more than one person. But I had one client, I'll just give you an example that when he was telling me about his borderline ex, which I believe he had, um, everything was, and then he said, but I think maybe she's a narcissist too. And then the more we talked and all the things he told me and what we were working on, the more he just started saying, and his mother's a narcissist. And I mean, and this could be true, right? But then it got to the point where everybody he mentioned was a narcissist. And then I started to see what he was exhibiting. And I'm like, oh, oh boy. Because then I'm realizing nah, he's probably would fit this diagnosis. And then some clients, when you get there, you can continue and they might open to the process. But often that's when a lot evacuate the therapy. So it's really about, you know, like you really have to, you really have to listen to the client. But then you also have to ask questions. 
And then you have to get into the client psychology and, and history and past as well. But I think that having said that, there are a lot of therapists that don't do that too, so well. There are many, many that do. So that's the other thing. If you if somebody does have to go to therapy for one of these relationships, type of relationships, then you really need to pay attention to how it feels for you. And if somebody isn't aware that they have a more severe issue, then they may have to go through a lot of therapists before they might find someone that can help them if they're open to that. Well, speaking on that, um, because I would love to go to therapy, but I'm not going to exactly hide the fact that I'm a men's activist and I want to make sure that I find the right therapist, not someone I have to spend a lot of money on to finally figure out that they're not right for me. Right. What are, and maybe, maybe you can't answer this, but what are some ways that of questions I can ask a therapist to make sure they're going to be right for me in the first session? Well, I think, um, and I think this applies whether it's a man or a woman, actually, probably, maybe more so with a woman. But um, I think you have to ask, um, depending on the situation, right, why you would go to therapy, you would have some ideas around questions you would want to ask. And what do they, you know, what is their expertise in? What do they usually deal with, et cetera? But I think, I think for men, too, and, and even if with a man or a woman, um, yeah, I'm not sure how it would be phrased, but I think I've had clients ask me. I think some clients have started off with me by saying, um, so do you understand anything about men's rights? Or are you just like, are you a feminist? Like I've had, I've had things like that asked of me right away or in emails before people book sessions. Um, I, I don't know if that being um, those kind of questions are, it, it would, I don't know how other people would handle those. But, I mean, I'm totally open to those. And so I would think that whatever the presenting issues, why somebody would be choosing or looking for a therapist are, you definitely should be able to talk to them about it. And also, um, yeah, if, uh, if approaching a female or, in some cases, men, to, to talk about your experience as a man and to talk about, um, like you said in the case where you said you're a men's rights activist, but to ask them, are they aware of men's rights? To ask them if they know what gynocentrism, gynocentrism is and questions like that. Because any any professional worth their salt uh, should, depending on the area they work in, but also should be very open to those kind of questions. And so if you don't get openness to the questions and or reasonable answers, then you know you're not talking to the right person. Because I, I have heard that from a lot of men. And um, maybe the first time I heard it a lot of years ago, I was a little confused. But I was like, well, tell me more. You know, like, I definitely want to understand more. And now when, when I'm asked those questions, and I think probably my YouTube channel and what I do, people know already, uh, men know already that I get it. But, yeah, questions like that would always be welcome from a man. You know, like, do you understand what I'm going through because I'm a man and because this or whatever was a woman? And, you know, and sometimes for clients, it's it's about their mother, too, you know, or it could be a man. It's about his father. But but yeah, just just to to really put it out there, because if a therapist doesn't know what gynocentrism, gynocentrism is and feminism, et cetera, then they're obviously not going to be very helpful. So something else that I've taken from you when that answer is it's not so much about what they know, but their willing, willingness to learn. And yeah, yeah. I guess one thing to look out for is if I go into someone's office and they seem to think they have all of the answers right then and there, that's not someone I want to talk to because there's no way they could know everything. And if they think they know everything, they're going to miss some important stuff. But if they're willing to learn from the experience and treats everyone differently as an opportunity to learn, I think that's a good quality to have as a counselor or therapist. Well, and I think that's an excellent point that you bring up because, you know, even among mental health professionals, there are personality disordered individuals. So, like, and I'll just use narcissists for an example. 
Um, and I've had clients come to me after working with a therapist they believe is a narcissist, and then they tell me the reasons why. So yeah, anybody that starts, I'm not saying it means everybody that would say that would be a narcissist, but it's not a good sign that if ever, if someone thinks they know everything, you know, like, and I've even caught myself and I never, I, I don't think I'll ever do it again. I don't think I know everything, but sometimes I'll say to myself, wow, now I think I've seen everything. And it's like, oh no, no, no. Cause maybe I got there a couple times years ago, but I realized that no, you, you can't have seen everything because you just never know. So I think, I think one of the best qualities, I, I, I don't want to brag or anything, but I think I have it. I mean, what a therapist should be also is inquisitive, inquisitive and open and not, and, and, and the way that I work with people, right, it's, it's egalitarian. It's, it's like, um, what do you call it? Horizontal relating, not vertical. And too many therapists are like, I'm up here and you're the one with the problem. No, it needs to be a working together and mutual respect. It doesn't matter when a client comes to me, whatever the issues are, whatever the challenges, the pain that needs to be processed, I'm there to help them. I'm not like above them. Okay. And well, I, I know. I Can I just say, and I know I don't know everything. Because the more you know, the more there always is to know. A funny quote from Tyler Blevins. He says, people who think they know everything are of great annoyance to those of us who do, Isaac Asimov. Well, and I guess I could only say that's probably an arrogant statement or you know, an egocentric statement. Well, I think Isaac Asimov is making a joke in that respect. Well, He's I was going to say, unless a joke, yes, of course. Yeah. But um, that's going to do it for us today. I thank everyone for coming out. I thank you for all of the great questions we got. And I thank you, AJ, for coming out. You are such a great pleasure to talk to. Uh, how are some ways people can find your stuff? Um, well, they can either look at, um, I guess, youtube.com slash AJ Mahari or my main website, ajmahari.ca. And... Uh, uh, if you want it, it depends what people are looking for, but I also have a podcast, uh, Surviving BP Relationship Breakup, which could also have to do with narcissists, but uh, it's all over the place too, so. All right, well, awesome deal. Uh, it's your first ICMI, I hope it has been a great one for you. Yes, and I, and I still have a lot of watching and learning to do, so it's going to keep getting better, but as far as participating it's it's been um a pleasure and eye-opening as well and i just hope i added a little something in in along with everybody else <laughs> a little something because there's a lot of people here that have been doing this for a long time and they know a heck of a lot more than i do in the well, conference i don't think you offered a little something i think you offered double a little something oh well thank you for that I'll just do the best i can <laughs> no but it was right, a pleasure well. I hope you have a good night. Nice right, to talk to you, you again. Bye.